Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 182, opening the box on Pandora, a look at this overpowered supers RPG and more. I'm Sean, that's Sean S, not Sean K. Reynolds, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your game nights better. We record these episodes live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So tonight, I'm going to be asking Sean about the latest game from Todd Crapper, the man with the best name in gaming, Pandora, which may or may not be a supers RPG, and we're going to find out. After that, we'll be sharing our thoughts on Revolution of 1828, a game that greatly outshines its theme. We wrap up with our usual week in review, where I've got a couple of family vacation games to talk about. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a snarky comment from Chris Groff on our list of best games by Canadian game designers that Mo republished in Time for Canada Day. Chris says, I don't know about Crokinole only getting an honorable mention. See, well, that oversight is 100% because despite living in Ontario my entire life, having one of those 50 in one game board thing that I'm sure Sean remembers, it was hexagonal and you could put plastic pegs and stuff on it and there were elastics and you could play chess and checkers and Chinese checkers and everything else. I never actually played a game of Crokinole. Now, based on the hype that sprung up in the last few years, which I still don't quite know why Crokinole suddenly exploded, but it's cool, I do feel I need to try it. But I don't like recommending games in our episodes I've never actually played myself. That's why it ended up in the honorable mentions. Now, if things have been better COVID-wise, this summer, Chris and I were set up to play a game together at Breakout Con, but it ended up neither of us felt safe enough to attend. Well, next we have a comment from Bez. Game designer from Stuff by Bez, who commented, Mo Tuznio, I'm listening to you chat about onboarding. I think that stuff like Fast Forward and Fog of Love is brilliant, but I think that the reason that video games are so strong in this area is that they can react to what is going on at that moment with the automatic adjudication enforcement of rules that you get in video games. I 100% agree that Tapestry could have been a bit better for newcomers. I mm. think that the rules were shortened too much, with the setup contents mixed together. A bit more detail and guidance would have helped me a lot. Well, thanks for the comment, Bez. Uh, well, I do agree that the reason video games can be better at onboarding is they are adaptable and can adapt to the players. I guess the real question, though, which we are kind of discussing on the episode, was what can we do to recreate that in our tabletop games? Like maybe a section in the rule book, and I've never seen this, but maybe like like which way rule books, where it's like, if this all makes sense to you, jump to page four. If not, continue to read more examples. Or possibly like Concordia has a system where it says the first time you play the game, after the first player plays, I can't remember the name of the card where you redraw your cards, uh, prefect, provost, uh, whatever it is. When you play that card and get your things back, you stop, and that person does end game scoring, even though it's in the middle of the game. Because in that game, players tend to focus on the board and the map and their actions and forget what they actually score points for. So again, it's a way to adapt. Whereas if players have played before, they don't have to do that. So I think it has been done to a bit. And I think it's well done in those games. But I honestly think there could be way more. It could be done better. Now, really, I enjoyed that topic a lot. We've gotten a lot of feedback on it with other interesting ideas on how to port over video game stuff to do uh, tabletop games. And I'm thinking this is one we might want to revisit sometime, even possibly pulling out things like how can we make onboarding in better in board games, learning lessons from video games as a standalone topic might be something we cover in the future. I can totally see us doing a whole episode on that one. Well, next to comment on our Marvel multiverse review and discussion, Brian Johnson writes, I love the yellow and blue boxes for the Mar for Marvel and the superpowers book. When it comes to RP and non-combat, then, you as a DM and the players made that up. The rules and stats they gave you is enough for a good DM to make it happen. Well, thanks, Brian. Uh, well, it's true, you don't need rules for role-playing to happen. 
And back in the day, that was pretty much the norm, that the games basically gave you a combat resolution system, and that's about it. But I think we've all come to expect some form of mechanical support for non-combat actions in role-playing games. Going back as far as AD&D 2nd Edition's non-weapon proficiencies and things like the opposite argument, right? Where people are like, D&D is a board game, which I don't agree with either because there are rules in there for doing the other stuff. To me, a good modern role-playing game, and I'm not talking like modern story game necessarily, just any modern role-playing game is going to address conflict resolution, not just combat resolution. And honestly, I still hope we see some of that once the playtest is done for the new Marvel RPG. Now, a couple things I want to mention about the new RPG is I just learned today that you can get it free on Marvel Unlimited. So if you have the Marvel Unlimited subscription service that lets you like on your iPad or whatever, read Marvel comics, the Marvel RPG today launched on there. So if you want to check out the playtest rules, they're now more available than ever. What I'm wondering, though, is do you have any idea how long it's going to be for the playtest? Like, how long are they planning on running it? Well, as of this afternoon, there's still no official dates listed on Marvel.com. I know some dates and timelines had been tossed around. I would love to see this come out in 2024. Yeah. I'd also love, however, not to see it rushed so that the players get the best game we can out of this process. We've already got. 20 pages of errata and updates wow. that are available for download on the website. And I'm, I'm actually interested. I would love to know if anyone has the Marvel Unlimited subscription. Drop a note updated. in the comments. Let me know if they've got the updated content in those PDFs. So you're, or you're on the online version or if you have to still go reference Marvel.com slash RPG. Yeah, I wouldn't call them PDFs because Marvel yes. United is definitely a proprietary way to read comic books. Yeah, I would love to know that. And I got to say 2024. Well, it sounds more reasonable for a role-playing game to come to fruition. I'm surprised they haven't thrown it down our throats yet. Possibly. Well, I think that's where we'll stop for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Now, we've got two giveaways to talk about tonight. Okay. First up. We need to announce the winner of our Grand Gamers Guild birthday burglary giveaway that we launched as part of our anniversary celebration last week. And that honor goes to Kevin Reno. Kevin Reno with his winning entry being earned by actually joining us for our live show, our actual anniversary episode recording, which is pretty awesome. If you're going to win for any reason, being there the night of the party is a great way to win. Absolutely. Congratulations, Kevin. We've passed your contact info over to Mark at Grand Gamers Guild, who I believe already hooked up with you yes. at the con and uh, has traded uh, traded packages at Gen Con. Yeah, it just happened that Kevin is down there to support Ryan Eiler and his awesome game Quad Heroes, which is launching a second edition. And while Mark's down at Gen Con repping Grand Gamers Guild and the two were able to hook up before the con even started. So that one's a done deal. Easiest contest ever. Now, last week, we also launched another giveaway where you can win one of our four best games we've ever reviewed. Out of everything we reviewed, we picked our top four. These are Unfair, Lost Ruins of Arnak, Space Base, and Gorinto. Since this is a big one, we decided to give you plenty of time to enter and lots of time for us to get the word out. So head over to TabletopBellhop.com and enter now. Also, please spread the word. Tell your gamer friends. This one has a couple weeks left, and we'll be sure to remind you again next week when it comes to a close. And unlike the other one, this one's open to the U.S. and Canada. Good luck. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. So tonight, I've got some questions for Sean, who recently finished reading through Pandora Total Destruction. Um, based on the Kickstarter, it was described as a tabletop role-playing game where players take on the role of overpowered supers trying to overcome a great evil. So let's start off with the basics. What is Pandora Total Destruction? Pandora Total Destruction was created, designed, written, and laid out by Todd Crapper. Development and safety editor was Kate Bullock. Editor was Vincent Harper. And illustrations are by Titi Nguagthong. And I really apologize for that pronunciation on that last name. I'm really not 100% sure on that one. Now, the content is decided is intended for two to five players ages 14 and plus and does require a D6, D8, D10, and D12. Yeah. 
Now I backed this project on Kickstarter myself at a digital level, but Todd was generous enough to provide us with a physical copy of a review, and we do thank him for that. Thanks, while Todd. I, while I haven't yet had the time or group to play this system, I have done a thorough read through and not just in a parking lot. <laughs> The premium color soft cover plus digital has an MSRP on Drive Through RPG of fifty three dollars or thirty one dollars for the for the black and white soft cover. Okay, before we get started, I do think a bit of disclosure is in order here. So, besides the fact that Todd comped us a copy of the physical book, I also know Todd personally, having gamed with him and under him at small handful of game conventions, as well as interacting online before and after that. I also know Kate pretty well, and I wouldn't be surprised if I've interacted with Vincent and Titi at some point in the past as well. These are people I consider friends. Heck, even one of our Patreon patrons, Danielle, was part of an actual play pod play test video, which was run by Todd himself that you can watch on YouTube, and was featured during the Kickstarter. Now, I don't think this has or will impact our opinions on Pandora, but I wanted to make sure we at least got that out there. Absolutely. And while I follow Kate and Todd and I've met them both, I don't have the same sort of personal relationship that with them that Mo does. So it's even easier for me to be unbiased in my review. All right. Now that that's over, now that we know where it came from, how much it costs, what are you actually getting for that money? Well, when you get the physical book, you're getting 155 pages plus handouts and character sheets. And this includes a table of contents, a glossary and an index. Though the index is before the appendixes and handouts, so it takes a bit of flipping or using a sticky note as a page stopper okay. to find it. Now, the book itself is sized at 7 inch by 10 inch, which is normal in a normal enough trim size, though not as common, I find, for RPGs. How about quality? So the book is a print on demand from Drive Through RPG. And while the content sometimes disappoints from, Darp from Drive Through RPG, I have <laughs> yet to ever have any complaint about the quality of printing I have received from them. This is a per bound soft cover with full bleed graphics and a generally solid layout. If I had to complain about anything, it's that the text creeps a bit close to the gutter for this type of binding and leads to cracking the binding more than many purists like to do. But it's <laughs> not something that personally bothers me. I crack away. All right, enough boring stuff. Let's talk about the game, starting with the premise. Now, I know this is a supers game, but Todd calls it an overpowered supers game and specifically calls out you're fighting a great evil. So this isn't your standard super street level up to cosmic level role playing game, is it? No, no. So this is a game that is about struggle, oppression, discrimination, racism, touching on some dark themes, as well as being a very lightly veiled story about some real world horrors that have played out around us, actually, in particular in Canada. Mm -hmm. This is a game about a world where superpowers have existed for decades, emerging from the beginnings of the nuclear age. Yeah. They flourished until one event showed the world the potential they had for chaos. And the world reacted, or as some might say, overreacted. What came next was a UN organization of 164 countries that mandated training for all empowered people, the Pandora Initiative. They instituted secure Pandora academies across the world. It's explained to the population of normals, referred to as nethers in the book, okay. that it is a way to ensure the safety of all, for the greater good, if you will, mirroring in many ways the residential school system here in Canada. I hope we can all see, even now, the dark path that this game can take. So somewhat like the plot of Civil War from Marvel, right? Though more the comic version of the story arc, not the, the, the MCU version. Uh, to agree, though, there really isn't anyone on the side of the government here. Oh, okay. Uh, this is more of an X-Men government ver uh, versus the mutants, governments versus the mutants, discrimination, hatred bred from a fear of people who are different from us. Okay, so a significant difference. So you're you're not going to play with the Iron Man side of the conflict on this time and the lawful versus the chaotic. This is definitely the oppressor versus the oppressed instead. Right, yes. So this game is written in a manner that is unique to me, at least, in RPGs. Todd has used blank, graphic-free pages to represent the story, the in-character fiction, about the world around the uh, the players. 
uh, for the GM or moderator in this game to use or read out. Okay. It is stark, but so is the world it's representing. And in that way, it's effective, not only in its ease of separating the game text from the world text, but also in allowing the reader to focus on what are, at times, some rather chilling words. Okay. Now, further on, he then goes to use the logo for the United Empowered Organization as the box text callout. Uh, and box text is used as the core rules reference for the players to <laughs> easily reference in the game. So... Wait, the rules are in the box text and the boxed read aloud stuff isn't in boxes. Just kind of a weird choice. It's like Todd was trying to actually go against the norm. Like, ah, screw you old D&D modules. I'm going to do it my own way. Is that, I, I have to assume that was done on purpose. I think you could probably say that and Todd might be able to enlighten us about his feelings here. But honestly, for this game at least, it just works. Okay. Uh, the moderator can focus on the blank pages for world building and a quick flip to a section lets you glance at the available box to get the rules you're looking for really easily. Okay. So supers are oppressed in this setting, which really isn't anything new. Like I said, look at X-Men, right? But I know Todd, and I'm pretty sure he would have taken these themes and really blew them up. And you already mentioned this a bit, but like, these are some pretty heavy things, and I'm assuming they're probably taken to extremes to make a point. Absolutely. Uh, this is, while not hopeless, pretty close. Uh, you're trapped against your will in a government-run school, <laughs> on top of which you are dangerous. Okay. You have done bad things and possibly hurt people. Mm. Question number two in character creation is, what terrible thing has the character done because of their power? Yeah, right there. The number two question in generation. So while not required, this has the ability to go very dark with the right group. Or the wrong group is what I'd worry about. So with all this heavy content and the fact Kat Kate was involved, I have to assume there's plenty of tools given to make sure it doesn't go the wrong way, that the game doesn't get taken too far or, and to prevent players abusing uh, a, a system and setting that I think could probably pretty easily been uh, taken abuse in a way, like like edge lorded or 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 run for tourism's sake, which I don't think is the intention of the game. No, and they did a great job with this. And uh, to be fair, I can't say I'm surprised. Kate has a rich history in safety, and it shows in this game, which, as you pointed out, has a real potential to go dark places. There is an entire chapter dedicated to the safety process, and it provides resources and guides to everyone through the processes. I have okay. to say that some, as someone who already does implement safety tools at my tables, I still learned new tips reading through this. All right, cool. So we did get a comment back from Todd, who is awesome here. So for those of you listening, you can't see this, but Todd actually joined us here for our live recording. So we're getting some live feedback right from the designers, which is fantastic. So Todd says, the concept is that the no art pages are from an actual book written by a reporter. And the UEO logo shows official documents, which are the documents that teach you how to play the game. It's as if, as this, if the uh, game was leaked. That's right. We're leaked from a secret UEO lab. Okay, right, besides being repressed and playing basically the other, what more can you tell us about the people you'll be playing in Pandora? So players will be taking on the roles of what are called level 13 empowered people. That okay. is the highest and most dangerous level of empowered people, making up less than a single percent of all the empowered. Players are the students at a Pandora Academy, which can vary from a school-like environment, you know, think, think of Professor X's, you know, to mm -hmm. an outright lockdown prison. Uh, you are in training, mandatory government organized training, trying to gain control over your abilities. But in doing so, you are also dealing with discrimination coming at you from all sides. I really like the concept that the academy can vary from game to game. It's, it's much more interesting than, yes, you're at Xavier School or you're part of the Barrel Academy or you're all prisoner. I like that there's the variety available there that's cool yeah no absolutely this is a narrative game and the goal is to tell an interesting and provocative story okay. now while it is technically possible to gain control of your powers and end up with a happy ending of graduation it is at the expense of a good story that you would do so uh, at least in one adventure arc uh you would need to follow a very specific path 
So the one thing I'm I'm getting a lot of vibes of CO2 here. So CO2 second edition um, from Vitella Serta very much to me felt more of a statement than a game. And obviously Todd is trying to make a point here and provide some social commentary, which I think is fantastic. It's great. It's a great use of this medium to hopefully open some people's eyes. But does this come at the expense of playing a game? Not to question Todd's designer chops or anything, but like as a Supers RPG fan, does it sound like playing Pandora would be enjoyable? So this is obviously going to vary group by group. But if you'd asked me if I would enjoy playing Teen Supers getting in touch with their emotions a decade ago, I would have <laughs> laughed at you. And this is an experience much like that in that it forces you to deal with topics you may have never had to face head on. As a, you know, old cis white male, a game like this may be the only opportunity I or others like me have to even begin to understand the sort of discrimination that others can feel on a regular basis and the, and the type of struggles that have happened in the real world to people around us just under the guise of Empowered. All right, fair. So we talked about the roles. Let's move on to the game part, right? It's a role-playing game. You mentioned this is a narrative RPG. How, how much of a hippie story game is this? Does it have a traditional GM role? What goes into making characters? And what kind of mechanics are we looking at? So the GM does exist, though not in a D&D &D form. Okay. They're there to guide and help call out the mechanical triggers in the narrative, but not shape the experiences as a GM running from a book or who has come up with this grand plan uh, that they want to guide the characters through. Right. right. So character creation is primarily question driven with different dice from D6 to D12 representing different levels of your three ability scores, which are conflict, interaction, and protection. So those are the three things that you're gonna be rolling uh, when it's appropriate in the narrative, uh, when there is a conflict, when you are interacting with something okay. or something around you, and then protection uh, of someone or something. Now, additionally, the character has three values which are vital to their concept. That's where we get into the kind of the hippie, <laughs> the hippie Story. aspect of the character, I guess. And so you get one each of a heroic value, troublesome value, and a psychological value. Okay. Now these get points both at the start and throughout the game, but we'll address on value points a little later. But the character sheet is just a single page. Uh, the second page uh, is a turn reference, which is just a help, help helpful way to figure out, you know, what all the numbers and everything mean, and we'll probably get tossed away after the first couple of sessions for most players. Okay, fair enough. So after character creation, the team goes on to answer more questions, and this is the really sort of fun part, and you're building the academy at which right. everyone is housed. Uh, and this is tracked on, tracked on a separate academy character sheet by the moderator. Uh, overall, there are a notable number of moderator sheets available for managing your games. I really want to thank Todd for giving this sort of wealth of paperwork available uh, to players and GMs. Yeah, I was wondering if the Academy was going to be something the group created together. I, I guessed I knew the answer, but it's good to hear this. Because because group word building is now something, honestly, again, to go with the fact that I want conflict resolution and not combat resolution. It's something I now expect from modern role playing games, especially narrative narrative games. And I'm not shocked at all and very happy to see it here. So. The game structure is broken into acts and scenes with each complete story taking on a three act form with optional prologue and epilogue that are purely narrative and not mechanical whatsoever. Okay. So act one is where characters ask questions, explore their academy and sort of five, help develop and figure out both the world around them, but also themselves and their interaction with each other. Uh, then now, I, I assume this is not like happy, shiny, let's go check out this room type <laughs> of explore the academy. Well, I mean, there's there there's, could be some of that, but then there are also uh, danger room training rooms in there and things where they can truly be tested. Uh, and they may walk into things they don't necessarily want to see or shouldn't see. Fair. Uh, act two, they start finding some answers and begin to start connecting some threads. Uh, you know, quiz, you know, hey, why does that? strange thing always happened at that time or who is this strange person sneaking in all the time you know things you, okay. you start to discover part of that misery and then act three is where things come to a head uh you get the revelations the monologues and most importantly 
the final battle. So scenes within acts are driven by points. Uh, they're moments in time that have a goal associated with them. Okay. At the beginning of each act, all the players, including the moderator, roll for a number of scene points uh, and can to redistribute them among the group. So you know, if, if one person rolled a one and somebody rolled a six, you can, you can give up some of your scene points to, to, to balance out the number of story beats that uh, you're looking for. Okay. Uh, and then there's a, a cost structure that I'm not going to go into all the details and charts, but there's a cost structure to generating scenes. Uh, and you use your points for scenes. You can, and the, the GM, the moderator can use their points to help the villain take focus in a scene. So you, the villain okay. can have sort of a, a big scene to, to reveal some stuff if they want to spend their points that way. So, uh, if the moderator, if the, if the scene has run down, so if they, if you're out of uh, out of action rules and the players have not achieved their goals, they do not get the benefit of revisions. It's almost like failing an adventure sort of thing. Okay. Uh, now, types of scenes include spotlight scenes, which are your generic sort of like, that would be the basic scene. Mm -hmm. uh, your battle scenes, and these are the big ones that happen sort of at the end of the act, so the big big moments uh, where. Not only are your players in danger, but so are people in the real world. Uh, battle scenes come with costs. Uh, training scenes where you can do pretty much anything you want. Uh, if you wanted to go back in time in the danger room and, and fight, you know, <laughs> Nazis, go ahead. Um, the training scenes allow you to explore and work on developing the control of your power, which is, a, again, the point of the Pandora Academies is to train and empower people. And then finally, there are vital scenes, which are a spotlight scene taken down to a narrow focus. Um, okay. So you're, you're spending extra points to, to very narrow in on a specific character and a specific aspect. Again, varying costs and outcomes and goals spread out among these types. And there are a couple of charts that sort of help, help players understand all that if you are sitting down and playing the game. Yeah, that's that's quite a bit to wrap your head around. And I got to say, a, a highly detailed, almost scripted structure, play structure, uh, doesn't surprise me at all from Todd. Um, High Plains Samurai, one of his previous games that I personally really enjoy, had a very unique structure to its play that I admit when Todd was teaching the game with his little PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> um, sounded limiting at first, but actually ended up playing great at the table. And I got to admit, at this point, it's not really clear to me I like trying to envision this in my head, how the three act structure works and how the points work and scenes and all that. But like you're spending points to, to accomplish things or are these points goals? Like uh, you said, you're, scenes so you're are setting up by your points. points. You're set, you're spending your points to set up the scenes. So I want to do okay. a scene about me exploring this and someone else says, Oh, well, while we're doing that, I would like to include this in the scene and I'm going to spend a little bit so that our scene includes this. And you so know, it's narrative currency. Right, exactly. Okay. So it's, it's, setting up, it's setting up the narrative the, the, the narrative for that scene by spending some of your available scene points. All right. At this point, not having read it myself, I'm just going to trust that it works. Yeah. So I think mechanically, this may be the hardest aspect of the game to wrap one's head around. Uh, again, the scene points are spent using charts provided in the book, some scenes happening at specific trigger points, uh, like again, a battle occurs when all the ever when everyone's points are spent and accounted for at the end you get to the end of the act and that's where you get a battle okay uh and then again the moderator has points to spend which is a strange sort of thing you don't normally think of uh in a narrative game like this the the, the gm having the ability to say oh, i'm making my own scene today <laughs> although although to be honest I, I first saw that in a super game which was the um marvel heroic role playing from cortex from margaret weas uh, margaret weas productions mwp where they had the the they called it like the threat pool and every time things escalated and bad things happened the dm got more dice and they could spend them then to make horrible things happen including if they managed to get up to 2d12 they could just end the scene right in a bad way so there is some precedent there even with supers games fair and so just to get things even more complicated, and I'm not going to delve into it, there are steps in each scene. And the okay. number of steps is actually how long a scene is, uh, and a, a step is an action roll. So if a scene is six steps long, you only get six action rolls, and it's over. Um, now, of course, an action roll isn't the same as narrative, 
you can have a lot of things happening that just On don't trigger an action roll or, or that are triggered by a single action roll. Yeah, that, that again reminds me a bit of High Plane Samurai. But yeah, at this point, I think I'm going to have to read it myself, try playing <laughs> the game or watch an actual play to really grok all this. But like I said, I, it sounds like it works. Luckily, we may even know someone who's in one of the actual plays. <laughs> there you go. Now, like mo most modern narrative games, this is not something where you sit down and play through an adventure designed by someone else. <laughs> even yeah. the moderator should have limited plans going in. Much of the adventure is players sitting around talking as if they were workshopping a fictional novel. And the moderator is there to participate, but most importantly, to catch when the narrative, narrative triggers the mechanics. So that right, point so at where, okay, we're at, an, a, we're at a point here that's interesting. Let's do something about it. Yeah, so a writer's room style RPG, uh, like we were joking earlier, modern, modern hippie game uh, versus a traditional petition the GM style system. And, and Todd says right there in the chat room, there is a lot of high plane samurai in Pandora. <laughs> yeah, so catching those trigger points is just so important because each role will advance that scene one step closer to its end. Uh, and so whenever things can be interesting due to the outcome of randomness or when powers are in use, that's when the GM, the GM moderator is going to step in and say, okay. okay, I think we should have a role here. Uh, powers being a big one again. Powers are a, a vital part of this. Um, and although I don't think we, I, I mentioned it before, uh, there is no you know chart of powers or roll on this to have powers. No, oh, you just pick yeah, your powers. Good question. This is just, you get a power. You're, you're going to have a power that sort of establishes who you are. Um, and I mean, I mean, it could be a, a, it depends on how you want to define it. But general, I, I would generally push players uh, for my reading to go with something rather general. Uh, I turn into a kaiju. Um, I control flame. Um, and okay. then you, from the narrative, build out more about that power as you go. All right. So so when one of these these triggers happen or when one of power is used, uh, what are the mechanics here? So you've described the intent either in the narrative already or the GM asks you to you know clarify and, and specify mm. the intent. Um, then we set the target number. The base number is a six. And then it's modified by uh, complications or other, yeah. you know, bennies, you know, value points are, are the bennies in this game. Um, uh, complications are part of the scene that make the action more difficult, whether it's slippery terrain, uh, a hail of bullets for shooting at you, a yeah, crowd of civilians nearby, stuff. you know, usual stuff. Yep, yep. Uh, and then you roll the applicable die, and there may be an extra die, either a power or an overpower die, to roll depending on various factors. Okay. So are you adding those? Or are you trying to you're best adding. of them? You're adding. Adding. Okay. Uh, if while using a power, you roll over the target number, uh, it's only if uh, while using a power, uh, you roll over the target number, you create havoc. And there's a chart for that on the uh, on your reference page to determine the outcome of the roll. But in short, under the target number fails, matching the target number is a perfect success. Okay. And over the target number is a success with havoc being caused. So you may not want those extra dice. I'm assuming they're not optional? Correct. Okay. So Havoc, that sounds fascinating. So so is this a resource? Like you've gotten over, you've, you've gone beyond what you needed to do what you were going to do and you've caused Havoc, which I got to say, talk about tying the theme to the mechanics right there. That's fantastic. Uh, is Havoc like a resource you can use to ensure success? Like you're like, I'm going to spend Havoc or is it just something you earn and you may or may not want? So... <laughs> Havoc gives you two things, really. Uh, first off, you get value points. And again, as we talked about, these are bennies and you can use, you, you sort of, you add those okay. to, your, uh, to your values and can be spent in, in various ways, sort of like a benny or a fate point. But Havoc is an interesting con, uh, concept in the game as it is both unwanted and beneficial at the same time. Okay. So as a student trying to gain control of your power, again, you are, that's why you're in the, you're in the school, you don't want to knock down a building or flatten oh, a landmark huh. or, you know, blow up the Dean's car. And yet right. you learn about things about yourself when these things do happen. Assuming you okay. manage to stay conscious. <laughs> Interesting. So additionally, players can choose to succeed or choose to fail, hmm. uh, though there are mechanical repercussions for such choices. 
Uh, but for instance, you might not want to cause the havoc indicated by your successful role and choose to fail. Uh, and in doing so, you gain a complication that's going to affect things later on. Moving on. Sounds kind of cool. I, again, the theme seems to tie in really well. Oh, I got to say, this particular choosing to fail is just such a hard concept for some traditional role-playing game players to grasp. There are way too many gamers out there, still out there in today's world, that are scared to fail. And I worry that could be a deal-breaker right there. Yeah, no, it's... And unfortunately, there's no real way, easy way around that. That's just, yeah. uh, you know, failing is good. And, and as soon as people understand that failing can be beneficial and we learn through more our failures... Um, yes. it's, it's, you know, the, that's how the real world works. And, uh, I guess some people just don't want any of the real world in their game. I, I don't I, know. To, to be fair, I don't blame them sometimes. So fair enough. So, uh, unlike many narrative games, this game can kill characters. Now, again, as mentioned, this is a dark reality. Uh, players can receive harm. Uh, and this is, hap this is something that happens through, uh, through Havoc. Uh, they can develop manifestations of their powers, which are sort of sort of extra things that happen or or can be done with powers. And uh, uh, and then they can gain the value points, which are the, that Benny or Fate point available for use in the game. Uh, similarly to uh, the value that the players get, the moderator can choose if everyone agrees to get thwart points, which are okay. sort of the, the GM's Benny. Now Todd's gonna it mentions here in the in the chat room he's absolutely correct and I haven't I haven't called this out enough. Uh, it's all about player agency, uh, and that's why this havoc is given to the player to spend. So you do okay. you you gain three havoc, and you choose what damage is done if and and whether you you, you can choose to hurt yourself rather than hurting the pedestrians or you know okay. uh, you can choose to hurt the pedestrians instead of hurting yourself. It's it's up to you what is being done it's not up to the dm what that happens when your powers go awry um and again yes absolutely todd the player agency is a massive aspect of of that havoc and and, and uh choosing to fail uh, or cho choosing to succeed uh features of the game oh sounds good and i also dig the fact there's resource management on i'm, I'm going to use the term screen but both sides of the the screen right yeah. something i dig but again traditional players don't like those dm intrusions no matter how many big popular monty cook games get released <laughs> it just doesn't seem to be a popular uh, uh mechanic in too many old school players fair enough though i have to say unlike many pbta games the GM does get to roll dice in this, which okay. I know is a bit of a relief to some GMs, myself definitely included. It's one of those <laughs> things that that I, I cringe while I'm playing masks because it just not rolling dice seems wrong. Uh, and I, yeah. I, I still struggle with that. Fair. I, I had <laughs> the same problem trying to run New Monera, So Yeah. So as well as all the mechanics and guides on how to play, the book features rich detail guides and charts to help you as a moderator bring your stories to life and to understand the world of pandora academies as intended by the author all right speaking of intended by the author right um i think most listeners know this you definitely know it you know how that i think every role-playing game should have a sample adventure right i realize it's not as applicable to most narrative games but like something in the back of the book that shows you how the designer wanted you to play the game now, you mentioned the game isn't really designed for pre-created stories, but is there something like a sample academy or a sample setting or a sample big bad, like something to at least get you the idea of what you can do with the system? So the answer is yes and no. Uh, so the, while there is a chart that helps give ideas about some plot directions uh, okay. based on the answers given during the academy creation, and it's fantastic. It's, it's a really detailed full page for every question. Okay. Um, there are some sample Academy staff and okay. there are, uh, some villains pre-gen, you know, sort of sample villains, but there are no pre-gen characters or pre-gen pre-built academies. Uh, okay. and I think that's good. <laughs> um, this game is made by its group contributions and perhaps its greatest weakness is a hesitant player, not willing to take part can lessen that experience yeah. for everyone. 
Uh, and that's something that I feel like, you know, handing out a, a fully fleshed out uh, or at least statted character to someone would enable. Right. Uh, I feel this game more than many that I have tried doesn't or won't deal well with the one player who just kind of sits in the corner but is handy in combat. Mm. Uh, now, Todd may have tips and tricks to help with that sort of player as, as you know, someone who's more familiar with this specific style of game. But I know for me, I would feel they would really bring down the sessions and, and I would struggle to have them uh, as part of the, the table. So my, my one concern here is playing with Deanna. Deanna does not like shared world building. She wants to sit down and be presented a story to react to. Now, character creation is different, right? You're answering questions for the character. I do worry a bit that this might rely a bit too much on it. Like a quiet, she would be that quiet character in the corner, not wanting to throw in new narrative objects. So I, I, I do have a feeling that's going to limit the audience of this game somewhat. Uh, perhaps. Um, although at the same time, uh, if they are willing to be involved in the character creation, that's a great start. And if you right. can keep that momentum into the academy creation, you get the buy-in for both themselves and the world right there because okay. it's not as much as creating an entire <laughs> uh it's not as much about creating an entire city or you know you there isn't as much uh out there to worry about because you can contain it inside the school but if it you sounds want. like the scene structure is even i want to have a scene about this and and there's definitely going to be for some players prompting from the the moderator who you know right or just people to get in there uh, without that. You know, if you if the moderator or GM isn't going to be able to do that, there will be troubles. Absolutely. Right. Um, I think uh, while the book on its own is, while maybe not suitable for a complete beginner, it okay. is a very strong foundation for playing the game, even as a newer GM. Uh, the deep immersion in the theme and plentiful, helpful tables, suggestions and guides uh, really make it pretty accessible for a wide range of groups okay. not just those who've already played a thousand narrative story rpgs um i would say that the dark content and importance of safety tools are actually more of a limiting factor than a lack of knowledge or experience in narrative gaming uh, though again based on what we talked about tonight it does sound like this could be some work for a traditional gamer to wrap their heads around um especially some of the more story game elements here. Um, something that honestly, I think wouldn't burden someone who's new to the hobby because they wouldn't have those preconceived ideas, but could definitely be a barrier for older hands. Yeah, sadly, this is too often the case. And I've run into many tribe players who've just hit a wall when trying to be involved yeah. in the narrative games. Um, yet thankfully I found others who embrace it. Uh, and I count myself as one of those converts. Uh, in this case, less experience in gaming, uh, trad gaming specifically, may be better than a lack of experience yeah. in just modern narrative. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So there's a great uh, thing here from Todd. So uh, controlling the environment and setting, which is, is sort of what, uh, what D might have, have problems with and, and struggle with is uh, that player agency. Uh, and the intent was Pandora to be available for anyone or groups who have been dealing with systemic or generational trauma, which is again, you know, as a, as an, and as, as a, as a uh, empowered player here, you are at, at taking on that role. Um, and, uh, that, that player agency helps the GM not go somewhere that they don't, that, that the players might not want to. It's an ec extra layer of that safety okay. by having so much of it guided by the players as well as the GM. All right. So one of the things we haven't touched on, we talked an awful lot about the overpowered supers part, but the original elevator pitch for this game is a tabletop role-playing game where you take on the role of overpowered supers trying to overcome a great evil. So what's with this great evil? Is it just the, the oppression you mentioned earlier or something less ephemeral? Well, the final battle of the third act is designed to be that big bad villain fight. Though okay. how that takes place or is represented is open to interpretation again by, by the table. Uh, and we are reminded that a villain doesn't necessarily equal evil. 
encouraging us to step back from simplistic tropes to embrace deeper ideas. Um, there is a plot that is developing across all three acts. There is a final battle, but it doesn't have to be a big monster or an ice shooting villain out to conquer the world. Could be the head of the academy who's slowly been trying to uh, warm up empowereds to become a force that will bring him to eventual power or, uh, you know, just crush the, the, the will of level 13 empowereds at, his, at that specific academy. Um, there's, there's a lot of different ways it can go and what that big evil is, is something that again is developed through the play. So again, are, are there, there examples or prompts or guides to kind of help you determine this as a group? Uh, so again, that's all part of the question process in building that academy. Um, okay, so it's and, right and yeah, from you, the you can you can develop out through that. All right, so every game ends in a big battle against some big bad. Got it. But that is that leads to one other question that I can't help thinking as you're going through all of this. Like, there's a lot of stuff, but this kind of sounds like like it's three acts, a big bad fight. Kind of sounds like a con game. Like this isn't a single session system, is it? So I think you would be hard pressed to fit a session zero for character creation and academy creation and three acts into a single setting. Okay. Uh, at least not with any sort of meaningful play and discussion. <laughs> uh, additionally, since it's highly likely anyone is going to gain full control of their powers and graduate from the academy in a single three-act adventure, there's nothing stopping you from completing additional adventures. Though you could just as easily, if it if everyone wanted to, start over and try a whole new academy. All right, fair enough. It just kind of, I was getting that vibe. I'm like, I know it's a thicker book. It's probably not for single sessions, but I'm like, I've been to con games where I played a five act structure at D and D live plays or five act structure. So I was a little concerned that might be all we were getting here. No, I think, uh, I think there's definitely the potential to, to really make this, um, you know, not only, not only one three act over multiple sessions, but multiple three act sessions into a sort of campaign until you know first one graduates or all your characters graduate and you start over you start if one person graduates they bring in a new character and they're the they're the rookie on the uh at the school now i'm assuming this wouldn't have any kind of character progression xp system or anything like that uh well i mean the thing that the 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 progression is you're getting control uh um, okay. you're, you're rolling closer to that six every time uh you're not okay. rolling you're not rolling a d12 as an extra dice so that you, there's no chance you're gonna, you know, uh, hit or uh, uh, hit your score. You, that's the the goal is to get get control of that power, and graduate as a uh, you know well educated and control under control empowered. I gotta say, there's definitely a dichotomy there of playing the most ostracized who have the most power that I find kind of fascinating. All right, what else we got? So. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't really have that much for me at no. this point. And I, there's been some interesting, uh, interesting chats in there. I think while this game won't suddenly win over trad gamers to the narrative style, yeah. I think for anyone who enjoys a narrative superhero game and is looking for something that is both challenging in multiple ways, uh, you know, emotionally as well as as a as a game and new, this is a game you should get in your hands. Uh, if you're looking for something more golden age and uplifting, this yeah. probably isn't for you. Uh, you know, few students are going to graduate and even coming out unscathed at all will be a struggle. <laughs> but for those who enjoy that struggle and that less pleasant reality of humanity, uh, the shared creation of stories and experiencing some of these hardships through the eyes of another, I think this game's a hit. Yeah, to me, this seems like a game for fans of a very distinct certain type of super story, right? Like X-Men, of course, comes to mind. That, that's that's the classic example of, of the oppressed mutants. Um, also, Runaways, um, one of my favorite indie comics called Freaks. Um, and of course, I can't help but see parallels to the Umbrella Academy when you go to power levels, um, specifically the, the one character there who Elliot plays. I can't remember the character's name off the top of my head. Um, I, I think, though, what I think is going to be interesting, though, is do you think, and this is this is a distinct possibility I wouldn't say is true of most other Supers games, do you think this is a game that modern story gamers and, and people who are interested in bleed and emotional responses would like 
despite the fact it has supers. Like like the supers thing is kind of the the, the dressing. Absolutely. I I think that's modern narrative gamers who want that visceral experience and want to make themselves uncomfortable. Uh they want to help understand other perspectives. This is a good game for them. Sure. Uh an open group that gets on the same page and takes the safety aspect seriously has the opportunity to have some real experiences here. Um, you know, to to spend some spoons. Uh right. and if you allow them to it can open your eyes and help inform about the real world around us and, and real things that have happened and are happening around us today. All right. Uh, so we talked about how the, the, the tie-ins to real life events are there. Is there like a resource section if someone wanted to know more? Just wondering if that's something Todd put in there, like, a, Hey, if you are interested in what actually happened in the Canadian residential school system, he, he Here's has, some resources for you. He has not that I saw. Um, okay. <laughs> unless I missed it, I don't believe so. Um, Todd, Todd may have additional information on that elsewhere. Just wondering. So honestly, that's it. That, that's all I have about Pandora Total Destruction, a modern narrative story RPG with some powerful messages. Now, what I want to know is, does anyone in the chat room have any questions we haven't covered yet? Uh, they can be directed at a Todd, who, again, is awesome that you joined us. Thank you so much, Todd. Or at Sean, who's read the books. Just one book right now. <laughs> well, the book. Maybe sorry. we'll see. Maybe we'll see more from him on, the, him on this in the future. I'll buy it as soon as there's a starter set in a box. <laughs> there we go. Comes with Mo, the Mo needs a map and dice. Yeah. <laughs> I don't necessarily need it. Well, I like maps, but you know, this is not a game that could come with a map. This, uh, this is not a map game. Uh, just a big, a big whiteboard, like, like with there grid. <laughs> the, a completely unnecessary there. grid. Um, but if it has a one inch grid, you can use it for other games too. So put a one inch grid true. on it. Don't put, a non grid, not smaller. don't put a non-standard grid on it or Mo will get upset. So I'm going to read off one comment here from uh, Anchi Games. It says, sounds like an amazing and interesting game. I'm super intrigued by it. Just I would eat my tongue if I tried to play it. So not for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, this is definitely something... Uh, um, <laughs> Did you saying the Pandora box? There's a lot of uh, a lost opportunity there. See? Absolutely. Uh, and Todd is saying that there is no resource. Um, so okay, uh, maybe maybe that. I was just wondering, like, like if you want to keep it thinly veiled and not pointed out. I was just thinking, yeah, you know, like if someone <laughs> does play this game and go, you know, are we doing it right? Is this getting the right impact across? Or or people really went through this or any of those questions? I just wonder if there was anything there linking to that. Not saying it necessarily has to be in there. I was just wondering if it was there. As I said, I haven't read it. I will admit, Todd also sent me a PDF copy, but I, I wanted to be the the straight man here and hear it from Sean and reply to that. Yeah, I actually I actually have all the PDF stuff because again, I did back this at digital. Uh, Todd mm -hmm. Todd got my money for this one uh, early on. I, I jumped on this one pretty pretty quickly. I uh, I think even possibly even before I realized it was Todd's name on it. Um, uh, that's so super you Kickstarter and supers RPGs. Yeah, I wouldn't yeah, be super surprised. Super Kickstarters uh, hook me right away. So, um, uh, I do, well, I guess, I, you know what I did miss from the actual premise of our show tonight. And I said, is it, or is it not a supers RPG? I think we did. Answer. I, I think it is most definitely a supers RPG. Absolutely. Again, there's, while I think a lot of people hate the fact that there is no, that defined power, you know, yes. I, I can shoot a fireball six hexes after mm -hmm. one turn. And if I put an extra three power points into it, I can, that doesn't exist. That no. absolutely doesn't exist. This is much more um again narrative uh where you are just sort of pay you know i turn into a kaiju okay sure we'll make that work and i turn invisible yep. okay sure we'll make that work i control fire okay sure we'll but make how that work. do i know if i could if i'm stronger than your character who cares right <laughs> uh again and, and that's and, the and, argument you're gonna get yeah. right and again that that that's where you know <laughs> it uh <laughs> Yeah, you say yeah, you shoot a fireball, you put too much power into it, you set the entire building on fire, trapping you and your teammates. This sounds like a real world experience someone might yeah. have had during an actual really play. Possible. Just saying. Um, well, I, I need to get a link of the actual play and put it in the show notes. Yes, we we'll absolutely have that in the show notes. We'll have to, um, I need to grab it ahead of time. Right, you can grab it off. It's on our it's on the uh it's on the, the RPG drive page, through right? drive the oh, drive through. Right? Oh, it's on the drive through page. Okay. Um uh, so yeah, well, you can find it there. All right. It seems like I've uh, already asked everything the chat room wanted to ask. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Todd, for definitely being here to answer questions. 
and, and Jeff, I hope we answered for you that this is, in fact, a hippie story game for you. Oh yes, Jeff. <laughs> Jeff, that, this this sounds pretty hippie story gaming to me. No, no offense to modern narrative gamers such as me <laughs> being silly. All right. Uh, so that's all I have to say about Pandora Total Destruction. Hopefully, I'll be able to get this to the virtual table at some point, and I can let you know how well it actually plays. In the meantime, yeah. what's an RPG that you like? that has got layers of reality under its theme. Let us know in the comments. Now, before we move on, I do want to announce a special offer from the man himself, Todd Crapper. He's provided us with a link that you can use to get Pandora in PDF format for only 12 bucks. That's a buck off. All right, so uh, we're going to drop a link in the chat room and we will be sure to include it in the show notes. For those of you listening at home, you can also use bit.ly slash Pandora Total Destruction, all lowercase, one word. So thank you, Todd, for the discount offer. That's fantastic. Now remember, as the Tabletop Bellhop, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Hello, and welcome to a review of Revolution of 1828, a two-player-only tug-of-war from Stefan Feld. Now, as Sean just mentioned, Revolution of 1828 was designed by one of my all-time favorite game designers, Stefan Feld. It features artwork by Alexander Young and was published here in Canada by Renegade Game Studio. Similar to Gunky Mono, which we reviewed last week, this game seems to be out of print, with no longer being listed at all on Renegade's website. Now, despite that, I can still find stock at most online stores, usually at prices under the $30 MSRP. Now, I want to point out that this isn't a typo or a mistake. This isn't the Revolutionary War or the War of 1812. This is about a whole different kind of revolution mm -hmm. in the United States that took place in 1828. Yeah, there's actually a section of the book that explains why the designers and publishers do feel that it was indeed a revolution. So the people who got over their hesitance to buy the game understand. No yes. one else, but... <laughs> <laughs> now in this game, you are reenacting the 1828 presidential election held by the newly formed Democracy of the United States, where John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson's were the candidates. Now, this was a history-making election due to the fact this was the first election to be fought not just at the polls and through voting, but through newspapers and other early media. Though really, except for the fact half the rule book talks about the setting of the game, none of this really matters in what boils down to a two-player tile-drafting tug-of-war where you're battling against your opponent trying to get the most votes, or rather points. Okay, now that we know a bit about Revolution of 1828, what are we looking at component-wise? So the components in this game are serviceable, but to me a little bit too abstracted, and a little too abstract for my taste. Well, it's easy enough to distinguish the 78 election tiles. Those are by, they have unique images on them and colors and they're easy to tell apart. And the artwork on the smear campaign tiles don't actually matter at all. So you don't have to worry about those. The problem are the 24 campaign actions, which are a huge part of the gameplay and only feature artwork on them with no indication of what they do while playing. While I understand this was done to help tie that theme in a bit more, I would have much preferred simple iconography that just tells me what the tile does, not what it's supposed to represent historically. The reference pages are a must, unless mm -hmm. you play this game often enough to have memorized them from repetition. Now that said, the quality of the components is good. Um, nice thick cardboard, well punched. It's a mounted board that's very functional, fits in a small box, which is nice. There are wooden meeple. Um, there's a nice bag to pull the tiles from and a good selection of vote counters in different denominations, as well as a very clear rule book that, as mentioned above, is at least half filled with historical notes and references explaining who and what all these historical figures and events that they're giving me instead of icons are what they are and why they matter. The components and pasted on theme is a bit worrisome, yeah. but let's move on to the actual gameplay. Yeah, here's where things start to really turn around for Revolution of 1828 for me. You set up the game by placing all of the round tiles in the bag and mixing them up good. 
You then draw and place three tiles from the bag on each of the six areas of the main board, which is pretty much just a strip of a bunch of rectangles divided into six different areas. Five are different campaign areas, and the fifth is the press. Now, in the center of each one, you place one of those meeples, the elector figures, and the editor is one, and then it's the electors for the other areas. And that's it. That's how you set it up. It takes seconds. I have to say, looking at the game on the table, set up, mm -hmm. ready to play, still doesn't fill you with an eagerness to play. <laughs> at this point, I was personally still mighty hesitant and wasn't sure I didn't want to just walk away from this game and its odd theme. So the player who filled the board goes first, and they're going to select one and only one of the tiles from the board. If it's one of the delegates, they place it on their side of the board under the matching campaign area. If it's a smear campaign, that acts as a wild card and can be placed under any campaign area. Now, if it's a campaign action tile, they get to do the action that's on the tile. Well, the action that's on the reference sheet, because the tiles don't really tell you anything. Now, the campaign actions are actually the most complicated aspect of the game. There's seven different types, and they do things like making your opponent draft from a specific part of the board, or drafting twice, getting a second turn, letting you move tiles from one campaign area to another, taking delegates from your opponents, and so on. The, this is the, the meatiest part of the game, and I don't think it's worth getting into here on this podcast. But I will say, overall, they basically let you mess with the board or the other player. Now, almost immediately, once you start playing, you start to see the fun, the challenge, and the strategy. You still don't care about the theme, but the game suddenly becomes interesting. Now, after you draft the tile, if it's the last tile in that area, you get to take the elector or the, the editor. Again, you're taking the meeple, putting it on your side of the board. Having electors is good. Having the editor is bad. That means the press caught you caught the press's attention that year. Now, assuming the meeple you just took wasn't disabled due to one of those campaign tiles, you then get to take another turn. Now, in this way, you can end up with a chain effect happening, either letting you or your opponent draft multiple times by emptying multiple areas on the turn. And there's a big race around getting it so that who has to take the last tile in each area. Now, no, taking a bunch of tiles and turns in a row could be a good thing or a bad thing. Setting up chains of actions when possible is the true delight of this game. Playing that balance of how much to set up and risking your letting your opponent grab the sequence instead of you. It's Now, once the fi final tile's drafted, the round ends and you enter a scoring phase. Here, you're going to get points in the form of votes, with the first three being awarded to the player who has the most campaign actions in front of them. I guess this is somewhat thematic because it's whoever spent the most time campaigning will get some bonus votes. You then resolve each of those five campaign areas one at a time. Now, this is a really simple area majority scoring system. The person with the most tokens on their side wins the vote. If there's no opposition, the opponent has no tiles on their side. You get two votes. If there is opposition, they get one. Ties, no one gets any votes. Then the player with the elector meeple, though, gets one point per tile they've collected on their side. Whether they had the majority or won, or not, or even won a vote. So due to this, it's possible to actually lose a riding, but get more votes due to controlling the elector. Again, I think actually kind of ties in the theme a little bit there. Now, once you've scored each campaign area, then you got to resolve the press. Both players gather up all the smear campaigns on their side of the board. Remember, these were wild cards. They could have put it into any riding. They're going to take them and stack them in the press area. Then the player who has the editor on their side loses a number of votes equal to the smear campaigns they collected. Super easy to count things up and come up with the score for the round. Now, at the end of the round, after collecting all votes, players clear everything from their side of the board except any smear campaigns they have. Those actually build up round after round. You then play through three more rounds, following the exact same rules as above, so that each player places the tiles and gets to go twice. After that, player who's got the most votes wins. All right. Well, now with the gameplay covered, it's time to share some final thoughts on Revolution of 1828. So first off, I think we both totally agree here that as Canadians, this theme does nothing, nothing for us at all. Uh, honestly, it turns me off. Like, this is a game that I would shy away from had I seen it on a store shelf. Had I not gotten a copy of this game along with a bunch of other games and a big board game sale on Facebook, I would have never given it a look. 100%. I would not glance twice at this game on a shelf. 
And I would seriously question, before having played it, to those who might recommend it to me. <laughs> well, I hope not everyone's doing that right now. Um, well, I'm sure there are people out there that will appreciate this theme. And there are some mechanics in there that kind of fit the theme, I guess. So it's not like Gunkamono level of abstraction. I can say the theme doesn't actually matter. And that's good because despite being a theme I don't care for at all, the gameplay is solid, like really solid. Yeah, the, the game is probably the most outside of the box, shockingly good game I've personally ever come across. Uh, looking at the box, sitting there on the shelf, it's a two. After playing it once, it's a solid 7-5. Yeah, I, I might even go up to 8 on this one for, for final ranking. Now, I do have to credit Mr. Feld for his work here, right? Now, I'll admit, when I first opened the game and started reading through, uh, for one, I saw the thick rule book, and I was like, well, it's a Feld, it'll be a point solid. Well, it ends up there's only like four pages of rules. And I was worried I finally found the, the exception to the rule, right? I thought I might have found a Stefan Feld game that I wouldn't like. It just sounded too simple. But then we gave it a shot and it was Deanna and I, and it was one of our date night charcuterie craft beer gaming nights. And it was a huge hit. And it's not often Deanna's not, doesn't love, despite being with me, who's always pushing her to play new games, doesn't really love learning new games. And it's not often she'll ask to play a brand new game twice in a row. And while this one, we played three times in a row, not three rounds, three full complete games. Later, when Sean was down in town, I'm like, you totally got to try this game. It's got the driest, most uninteresting theme ever, but it's so good. And Sean's like, oh, I don't know. Isn't there something else we can play? But what'd you think when you finally got to try it? You know, you were right. And while I played just about anything once, I was not eager, even as I watched <laughs> you set it up. But if someone asked me to play now, I can't think of why I would say no. Now, maybe I say it too often. I, I feel like it's like one of my catchphrases, but I like the way this game makes me think. You really have to try to plan ahead, both in what you're going to draft, as well as predicting what your opponents are going to grab and knowing what those cards do and where you're going to move things. And I got to say, this gets much more intense near the end of the round when you're trying to figure out just how to combo your grabs to get the most tokens while trying to force your opponent to take stuff they don't need or don't want. Like you can totally do it the other way where you force your opponent to take seven smear campaigns. Well, I don't think you can get seven, but take three or four smear campaigns in one turn when they've got the press on their side. That's a brilliant move to figure out. Yeah, I think this one, the thinky part is so well balanced by the speed of the game. Yeah, there just isn't a lot to it. And yet it gives you a lot to work with and plan yeah. about. Yeah, the smear campaigns in particular, right? The timing of who gets the editor meeple can be a huge part of this. Like having wildcard tokens you can place anywhere can be in huge points, especially if you can get an unopposed win with an elector on your side. And every token you pile in there is another vote. But as noted above, winning a campaign area doesn't necessarily mean you get the most votes. So that's kind of interesting there too. But collect too many spear campaigns and you risk your opponent making damn sure you get that editor at the end of the round, which by the fourth round of the game, there's usually a huge pile on both sides of the board, making all that extra jockeying for votes earlier mean nothing. Now, one big thing I did note as a downside to all this planning is a significant amount of AP or analysis paralysis. This is a thinky game. And it's not a, this is, this is not like a quick playing, make your move, make your move, two player romp. Both players are probably going to spend a lot of time planning out their moves and doing the math to figure out the best order to draft things and figuring out how to disrupt their opponent's plans. You're going to sit there and I've seen people playing this, counting on their figures going, okay, I take one, you take one, I take one, then I'm going to use this and get a bonus and you take one, right? Despite not looking like a chess game or feeling like a chess game or having chess-like mechanics, this game to me has a very chess-like brain space. It very much feels like a chess match against your opponent. Indeed. While the move tree is nowhere as deep as chess, no. there is still plenty to consider, especially with that tech take an extra move mechanic and mm -hmm. the eagerness to try and string out as many actions as you can. Overall, we've all been enjoying Revolution of 1828 way more than we ever expected to. This game was a huge surprise to me, and I'm so glad I gave it a shot in the first place. This was a game I didn't have any interest at all that turned out to be a fantastic two-player tug-of-war that even features the small footprint that Deanna and I love 
which makes it a great date night game and a game for playing at pubs or cafes. Now, this is another one that with like a roll up mat could take up even less space. Not that yeah. it's a big box. Even then, you don't even need a board, really. You just put the meatballs out and lay the three tiles next to them. Now, the fact this great game is out of print right now, I think is a really good indication that we're not the only gamers out there that just passed this one by. And that's a shame. Revolution is now on our personal list of great best two player games. And I expect to keep playing this along with classics like the Duke, Onitama and Patchwork. If you're looking for a brainy, high strategy two player game that's pretty easy to learn, as long as you keep that reference side of the rule book face up, I don't think you'll go wrong with the Revolution of 1828. Just do not judge a book by its cover. Find someone who has it. Find a store to demo it. Buy the game, not the theme. <laughs> now, if you're an American history buff, I, I guess this one would be a no-brainer. Not only do you get to play out in an infamous election, you get lots of behind-the-scenes information. And unlike us, you probably care what each of those smeared campaign tokens actually mean. I can also see this being popular with educators, especially in the U.S., giving you the ability to use the game as a tool to teach a pretty heavy and divisive subject. Maybe. Even after multiple plays as a Canadian, I still don't care about the theme. I just enjoy the strategy. Yeah, maybe it'll give someone some true-false answer questions they might be able to get right. Now, if you don't like two-player-only games or games that, while easy to learn, require a bit of concentration and planning, this one probably isn't for you. The big thing here, though, the, the, the big thing that I hope everyone gets is just don't let the theme scare you away. The fact it's about a U.S. election is the least interesting part of Revolution of 1828. Well, that's it for our thoughts on Revolution of 1828, a great two-player tile-drafting area majority game that also happens to be about a famous U.S. election. Now, what's the last game you played where you were turned off by the theme but ended up loving the game despite it? Tell us about it in the comments below. Also, I invite you to check out my written review of Revolution of 1828 on the Tabletop Bellhop blog, where I get into a little more detail about things like the campaign actions and exactly what they let you do, as well as offer up plenty of pictures from our gameplays. All right. And now the Tabletop Bellhop. Tab yeah. And now the, the Bellhop Tabletop. tabletop. tabletop where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Though just before we do, I would like to say a congratulations to Ajit George, who just came away with this year's Diana Jones Award. Oh, cool. I am sad to say I do not know that name. I would have uh, to look More D&D focused than I think uh, we normally... Uh... Uh, okay. So for um, my family, we spent most of the last week up uh, well above Toronto, in Campbellford, Ontario, staying on my uncle's farm. Um, beautiful piece of property, very picturesque, uh, very hilly area of the country. Um, in addition to visiting family, we also checked out a local brewery called Church Key, which is the most hipster brewery I have ever seen. Um, they literally sold upcycled plaid shirts embroidered with their logo. Um, we went to a cheese co-op that had fresh cheese curds and ice cream made with local milk and the beautiful downtown, which was filled with a really interesting eclectic mix of shops, uh, like the Peculiar Platypus, Frog Whiskers, Inc., Kerr's Corner Books, where I picked up a copy of Point Salad, and an actual game store called Webheads that had seen much better days before COVID hit. I guess it used to be more of a gaming space where the people, they ran D&D events, and it was a little bit more of a bait shop than a gaming store anymore, but I guess you do what you got to do. Uh, we also hit up the best swimming spot in Ontario that I've ever seen, the Crow Bridge Conservation Area. Now, if people are interested, I'll probably talk more about the vacation and the after show. So if anyone in the chat wants to hear more, stick around. Now, as for games, we were pretty busy. So I didn't get a lot of gaming in, and that wasn't really the plan. I did bring a milk crate through because, well, I'm me, so of course I did. Um, I did end up teaching the family Telestrations, which was a huge hit. Though I do have to say, I was a little disappointed because I cracked my game open. And this is the Telestrations 12-player party pack that we reviewed recently. I have not had this long, like less than a year, and most of the markers had dried out. Now, thankfully, there are only seven of us, and my uncle had a couple spare markers, so we were good. But I am disappointed because my eight-player set of Telestrations that I've had for, I don't know, 10, 15 years, uh, they're perfectly fine. 
but these new slim markers, which I appreciate drawing with, didn't seem to last at all, which kind of stinks. Yeah, definitely a concern. Not the dry erase markers are hard to no. find, but you may not have them at hand when you break out your copy of a game expecting those included to work, especially one as new as this. And it's not like we played my copy a million times, right? I, I was shocked. Um, Gameplay-wise, though, Telestrations went over way better than I expected. Uh, we actually managed to convince my uncle and my mom, both, who like to claim they don't like games at all, but were willing to try. Um, as expected, there were points where we were actually laughing so hard it hurt. One of my kids basically fell out of a chair, and I'm pretty sure my family is going to be talking about four-legged ducks for a long time coming. Now, is that like cheap ducks? <laughs> In the way that we're still talking about cheap ducks that many years later, yes. <laughs> now, the other game I brought um, and taught to the family was Bean, or Bonanza. And that one didn't go over quite as well. Um, at least one of the players had a hard time keeping track of when you could play cards from your hand, when you were allowed to trade, what you were allowed to trade, and what you had to plant. And having difficulty with when you traded cards, wanting to put it in your hands. Now, surprisingly, no one had a problem with the yet to keep your hand in order. Don't rearrange. That went over well. So that, that wasn't perfect. I will say, though, my aunt and her niece, uh, my cousin's daughter, loved it. Um, the big lesson learned here for me, though, was this is another reminder that, that for most of us hobby gamers, myself included, Sean, even now who wasn't as much of a hobby gamer five years ago, we tend to think of Bonanza as a pretty simple game, right? Like, here's a gateway game. This is simple. This is easy compared to, you know, we're not sitting down to play Kanban or something. This is actually a lot to take in for a non-gamer. Well, I do have to say, if we ever do go up that way again, I will bring it again because my aunt did seem to really dig it, but I'm pretty sure some of the other players will sit out. I think in general, if you have a heavy card game player, they're probably more willing to play a game like Bonanza. But when someone's like, nah, I don't really like games, you throw it at Telestrations because it's silly fun. But Anza was a bit much. So again, it was it was a reminder to, hey, this, this these games aren't quite as simple as we think because we're used to playing more complicated ones. And again, no bashing on anyone who doesn't get Bean. That is not what we're talking about. It's always nice to get those reminders and have the uh, chance to reevaluate our ideas of game difficulty uh, because, again, it's one of those things where we're used to a certain level of knowledge and uh, ability, and we're being raided right now. Hey, guys, welcome to yeah, the, uh, the raid. Welcome to the chat. Hello, Thank Raiders. you, Cypher Unlimited. Thank you. Live. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's just it's nice to have that sort of reality check to think, oh, yeah, that, that game... That game's not Uno, right? It's yeah. It's no, it's, it's not. <laughs> like even just trying to explain it, I'm right. Like I, I have a way to teach Bonanza. I'm like, all right, you plant the first bean in your hand. Now you can plant the second bean. Now you go to market. You can see the two beans are available for trade. Now you all trade. Which to me, that all sounds pretty simple. But it's the when, what you have to plant and when. And despite going around the table multiple times, people are having a hard time with. Oh wait, I have to play my first plant. That means I have to plant it. And I'm like, yes, we need to right. plant that. So that that wasn't the best choice. Um, I also had trap words. I think that might have been a better hit. And we had code names. I think I should have broke out one of those. The thing was, we had talked up Bonanza the night before, and my aunt really wanted to try it. So it's just the way way things planned it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Although I think trap words would probably have surprised you with its level of difficulty as well. Although I guess you can sort of you can handle more of the I difficulty can handle yourself the dungeon part and let and let everyone and else. And I wouldn't just have handle. used curses, right? I, yeah, it it just would have been a score trap. Yeah, I'm, I was thinking the about the concept of trap words is basically the same thing as um I never remember the name of that game. Word you can't say oh, there's yeah, a game yeah. that it's based on that <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. drawing a complete blank. I know the, I know the one you mean though. But yeah, no, you're right. I, I I kept thinking that there's there's a bunch of, of sort of handling to that, but you, you could take that on yourself and not. No, I could take that. Like, that. like I just tell you, you have to write seven words, you get to pick three traps, right? Like that's yeah. that part of it. Like I wasn't gonna bring a letter jam. That one I know is is a little odd for people. Yep, no, that's fair. All right, well, how so, about a look ahead? What do you have uh planned for the coming weeks? Okay, so while we were up north this past weekend, Tori and Kat are headed up there this weekend so and then they had a wedding last week and they're not available the week after that so any gaming over the next few weeks going to be with the family for for the next little while um that said i do hope to get scythe out at brenda's talking about a game not for non-gamers but you know what brenda got it pretty well so 
And I'm hoping DNI can fit in a gaming date night sometime soon. Um, I'm not sure exactly what we'll play. It just it's it, now it feels like it's been long enough. I want to have another one. Um, and also since I didn't crack it open on the farm, I considered it. I do have a shiny new copy of Point Salad uh, that we got for a very reasonable price at a very nice bookstore. Um, so that needs to be unboxed since it's in shrink. I might as well. So I figure I might as well do that and um, maybe a few other games this weekend, uh, including Dana is insisting and she thinks it's going to be hilarious. She wants me to unbox our sh new and shrink copy of Racco. So we're, we're going to see how well us doing comedy videos goes, I guess. So I'm going to unbox Ra Racco. Um, we should have our next insert build ready to go. Uh, long overdue, but I built the insert for Clans of Caldonia. Uh, fantastic Euro game. Uh, economic game market management board control scottish clans selling making whiskey very unique game um that was built from folded space so i've got a full video of building it and then transferring all the bits into it um a review will probably follow shortly thereafter um we have we have like the sean's put his draft up on youtube deanna and i still have to look at it and decide what we're gonna do um so we might be able to get that out uh potentially as early as next week um, but what I want to do is I want to play the game once and see how much it helps. Like for setup, takedown, having the little player trays, does it help? Is Are they useful or are they just annoying to get things out of? So that's on the list. Um, but as usual, no, nothing set in stone. So we'll see how things go. Fair enough. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. All right, first off, I have to send out a very warm welcome to Tiffany Freeman, the latest Tabletop Bellhop Patreon patron. Thank you. Welcome, Tiffany. And Valentine Pache. Thank you. Mechanical Muse. Thanks, Muse. Matt Lichtenwalder. Thank you, Matt. Roger Malosh. Check out Roger's game design work at Roger Dodger Games. Note, no second D in Dodger. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice. Digging the show? Just like Tiffany, you can support us at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us, and you're welcome to stick around for our penthouse suite after show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.